Thank you. It really is a privilege to um, welcome you all and uh, to be one of the first uh, voices that you hear tonight. But um, what is amazing about tonight is that it will expand the voices that you have heard and the opportunity for those to speak. Um, I am going to apologize before I begin because this is, as I think most of you know, graduation season. And uh, in my role, there are uh, four events an evening. And, um, but this, this was important. It, it was important uh, for me to be here tonight and to thank all of you and to welcome you uh, to MSU uh, if you're not on campus and, of course, to welcome you to the museum. Um, I think all of you are aware of the incredible exhibition that was and is collaboratively uh, co-curated over the last six months by the Museum's Survivors and Allies Advisory Council. And um, so tonight's event um, is part of that, um, that set of events uh, where we have an opportunity to expand our understanding um, um, as this exhibit has helped us understand. Uh, I think all of you know that the council worked closely with the MSU Museum team to create this installation and that it honors the sister survivor's vision through prose and poetry through the visual arts and um, through collective artifacts. Um, tonight, uh, the roundtable discussion is entitled Repeat Art, Ceremony, and Healing in the Shadow of Violence, and it's co organized by the Army of Survivors. Uh, we'll hear from the artist and the designer associated with the exhibition, as well as from a community curator and two scholars of art trauma and recovery. Uh, that's the first part of the evening and that will be followed by a musical selection from a choral group and then uh, a spoken word poetry event that is organized by the students from our residential college of the arts and humanities in their center for poetry. Uh, we're fortunate that the round table tonight uh, will be moderated by Carlo Abbasadano Yates of the Broad Art Museum and she will help explore the power of the arts to dramatize suffering, to ease grief, and to help remake the shattered worlds. Um, we invite you afterwards, if you've not had a chance, to explore the exhibition and then to share your reflections on those powerful works. Again, thank you for being here. I know it will be a meaningful evening for all of you. So we always do uh, multiple introductions here because this is a co-organized event with the, uh, like all of our, our speaker series for this, for this series, uh, speakers events with uh, the Army of Survivors and here zooming in from closer to Detroit is Grace, uh, Grace French who is the founder and president of the Army of Survivors and if this technology works, uh, we'll get to hear from you in a moment. Turn your mic up. Um, so I'm really excited that you guys all get to witness uh, some of the artists <coughs> and 
about um, the better feeling journey um, and that we're all moving towards that goal, goal as a community and healing. Um, so I'm looking forward to listening and learning with you guys as we continue to heal together. So thank you guys all. I do want to remind everyone uh, that the proceedings uh, of the series are always videoed, and along with the Army, we, uh, we do post the videos uh, so that sister survivors and other community members and students can have access to the footage. So please be mindful of that, especially during the Q&A uh, section. So I'm just delighted to introduce our moderator for tonight. Carla Acevedo Yates is a very close colleague of ours. She's an associate curator at the Broad Art Museum. She's an international curator with experience uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as in North America. Her, her master's is in curatorial studies and contemporary art from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard. Uh, and um, she has extensive accomplishments uh, at, at awards and so forth. She is, I will just quickly mention, curating, in addition to her many other wonderful works in her portfolio, a, a really remarkable exhibition that is opening at the very end of this month, That's uh, at the uh, May 31st, uh, the Edge of Things, the, uh, which is Explorers Dissident Art uh, Under Repressive Regimes in uh, the Southern Cone, both in Chile and Argentina and Brazil, and is paired with an exhibition that will be opening here as well on popular arts and resistance in Chile from the same period. Uh, it is uh, wonderful to have her here. She's going to give the introductions and then we'll move on to the panel itself. Thank you, Carl. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Mark, for the introduction. I'm extremely honored and humbled um, to present our panelists today Alexandra Berkey, Jordan Fishman, Elena Cram. Kelly Hansen, Valerie von Frank, Karen Sitzlowitz, and Ellen Schatzsteiner. Jordan Fishman creates large-scale paintings that deal with the interconnected themes of power dynamics and internal conflict in relation to sexual violence. In May 2019, Fishman will receive her BFA from the Penny W. Stamp School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. She has shown her work in solo exhibitions at Whitdell Arts Gallery in Detroit, Michigan, Alimentación General Gallery in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the Wassenberg Art Center in Bangor, Ohio, Ben Gallery in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and in numerous group exhibitions nationally. She has led community mural efforts in Grand Rapids and Detroit and sits on the Engagement Council at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Alexander Berkey is 28 years old and the owner of Brightly Twisted, which has opened their first brick and mortar on Michigan Avenue in Corktown, Detroit. In her own words, I am truly honored to display my work. This exhibit allows the outside world to see our darkest moments, but it also allows them to understand a little bit better the process of surviving sexual assault. Kelly Hansen is a graphic designer for Michigan State University Outreach and Engagement, and has been the exhibit designer for the MSU Museum since joining MSU in 2013. For over a decade, Kelly served as his creative director at Blown Creative Partners, an advertising agency in East Lansing, and was a successful freelance graphic artist for another seven years before accepting her current position. Kelly received her BA in advertising with a focus in studio art and will graduate this May with a master's degree in arts and cultural management. She's an artist in her spare time and has exhibited works at the Scarf Club in Detroit, the Ann Arbor Art Center, and in Howe Magazine. Elena Cram is a visual artist and holds a BFA in textile design from Moore College of Art and Design. Valerie von Frank is a mother of two beautiful daughters. One of them, Grace French, is a sister survivor and founder of the Army of Survivors. Valerie works with parents of sister survivors in Gage, which supports and advocates for our daughters and other survivors of sexual abuse and assault. In past lives, she has worked as communications director and a writer and editor focused on pre-K through 12 professional development. Karen Sitsowitz is currently interim chair of the Department of Art, Art History and Design, where she teaches art history. She's a specialist in the modern and contemporary art of India and South Asia. Her latest book project is called Infrastructure and Form, Contemporary Art, Globalization, India. 
And finally, Ellen Chet Snyder is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Women's and Gender Sexuality Studies at Brandeis University. A psychoanalytic anthropologist, Dr. Chet Snyder specializes in the comparative study of material objects in the context of trauma, remembrance, recovery, and healing. She is the author of Immortal Wishes, Labor and Transcendence on a Japanese Sacred Mountain, Duke University Press, and is completing a book manuscript on traumatic memory and material objects, especially dolls and human figurines, in wartime and post-war Japan. She has served as an advisor to the Finding Our Voice project and helped organize express arts workshops for sister survivors and family members. And with that, I invite you to give a very warm welcome to our first panelist, um, Alexander Berkey. Uh, 
better? Yeah. I'm the artist who made the triptych painting upstairs entitled Together We Roar Part 2 that details the internal struggles and steps towards healing that I have endured as a result of this sex scandal. I want to thank the MSU Museum and all the staff who I have worked with for including my work in this amazing exhibition and for working with the sister survivors to put it on. I've been writing this speech in my head for about two years now, and I'm thankful I finally have a platform to say it. I have so many thoughts in my head that I thought it would be easy to pour them out on paper, but in attempting to write this speech, I can't seem to find the words to articulate how it feels to realize what he did, and how it feels to realize, and how it feels to paint about it. There are too many words. Up until recently, I've kept my experience and my struggles very private because of denial, doubt, confusion, and fear. But I no longer want to be silent. I want to use my voice for all other sister survivors out there just as they have given me strength through their voices. So here it goes. I feel very grateful to have found two passions in my life at a relatively young age, gymnastics and painting. In the circumstances that I find myself in today, these passions have collided. I could attempt to describe how it feels to finally understand what happened to me and so many other girls and women. I could attempt to tell you how hard it was to face my painting each and every day because it was a constant reminder of my pain. But I think my painting tells you these things better. I think my painting tells you what I could never say. It tells, you how, it tells you how I have felt an amount of pain I did not know I was capable of feeling. It tells you how I have felt numb for so many years. It tells you how my relationship with my family has been strained. How my relationship with my friends have been strained. How my relationship with men has been strained. How my relationship with myself has been strained. It tells you how I'm consumed with struggle, how my mind can't stop thinking. It tells you how I am so angry, how I am weak, how I'm confused. It tells you how the little girl inside of me is finally breaking free. How I now remember the woman I truly am. It tells you how I am strong. Something has been taken from me that I can never get back and that can never be repaired. But in making this painting, I feel I am finally taking my life back. I am taking my body back. I am taking a stand. Making Together We Were Part 2 has helped me tremendously in understanding my experience and my healing process. Even on the days when I'm exhausted emotionally and mentally, I still have fight left in me. I will never stop fighting through artwork for what is right and what is just. Without the army of survivors, I would not have been able to find this fight within me. This painting is a thank you and a tribute to the army. I am so, so proud of us. Let us never forget our pain and always remember our power. Our pain reminds me of how far we have come and our power reminds me of how far we are going. In our continued journey to seek healing and justice, I believe we must continue to unite, because when together, we can roar. To end, I would like to recite a poem I wrote that has now become my art statement for my triptych painting upstairs. Somebody was the something, and somebody was the nothing. You wanted us to be the nothing, but we are the something, so you are the nothing. Then there is justice. It feels like a lot when I feel like nothing. Nothing feels like something sometimes. Sometimes people aren't okay. Okay isn't what to be all the time. Time is what they say you should take to feel like something again. Again, time didn't work. Work got in the way. Way to go, life. Life keeps going, going to be okay. Okay.
Hi, I'm Elena Cram. I do the um, three panel tapestry. Um, I am going to. This is too tall. Am I too short? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Moore College of Art and Design. Um, I graduated with a BFA in textile design. Um, my piece is a 100% cotton hand dyed with Prochon um, fiber reactive dyes. Um, they st it's, my panels start small and get larger. They are um, all together supposed to look like a sunset, to be looking to the future and hoping for um, healing. Um, as I wove them, I got you <coughs> on a loom, you sit and you find a rhythm. And in that rhythm, you're able to meditate and think and heal, in my experience. Um, my abuse started before I went to school, and during school, um, when I was in Philadelphia, I actually traveled back to Michigan to see him. And I now realize in fin finishing this piece that I held on to some of that abuse and trauma and I was able to let it go with putting this piece and fi finishing this piece. Um, so it's been very healing. <laughs> I wanted the blues and um, to have the feeling of the darkness but at the same time the light and of the sky and the waters, the calming liquid um, flowing. Um, in the centerpiece, there are some brown areas or spikes, I guess, triangular uh, objects that are to be portrayed or to be seen as things that are always coming towards you that you deal with as a somebody that goes through trauma. Um, you never know when it's coming, but you ultimately are able to overcome it. Um, I hope everybody is able to look, in art, look at art in a very freeing and healing way because there is no right or wrong way to do art. There is a lot of um, healing and surprises that come with it. It's never really something that can be planned but comes out as a beautiful piece for anybody to take their own meaning out of a piece. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Sunny fixes that. I'm going to uh, start talking so that we don't delay too much. Um, I think I was invited here today to tell you about healing. My healing as a parent, other parents' healing, maybe how we healed or ways to heal. So many times in our society, I think we continue to try to rush toward a resolution without taking the full measure of our struggle and without deeply and honestly listening to those people who are still in grief, who are still traumatized. MSU's esteemed Rebecca Campbell said, trauma lasts as long as the survivor says it lasts. And it's not just in this case that we rush past one another and want to believe everything's okay now because it's been a certain period of time. 
How many people in this audience have lost a parent or a child or a sibling? Raise your hand. How deeply do you still feel that loss? Do you just forget about it? How many of you have had a surgery? Raise your hand. If you've known this kind of deep grief or physical injury, you know that the scars last. I think we often don't want to acknowledge one another's scars, especially when it comes to having to acknowledge sexual abuse of children not only exists, but is virtually rampant. That incest is the largest portion of that abuse, and that our society is not dealing with these facts. As a mother, I taught my daughters all the things they were supposed to do. Cross the street, avoid groups of males, don't get on the elevator alone, cover your drink, always have a safe friend, on and on, the things that we tell our girls. We think that if we teach our daughters these things that they will be safe, and they are not. No one saw this coming. Some who might have looked, who might have looked the other way. Who would expect a doctor to molest a child? Who would think a mother could be sitting there in the room? So how as a parent do you respond when you know that you've failed? We have few common rituals in the United States, I think, and even fewer for dealing with traumatic grief. We've lost our mourning bands, periods of seclusion. With death now, it's three days and back to work and all is well. We used to have more rituals, I think, rituals that remind us and bind us. For me, dealing with the initial impact of my daughter's disclosure, I could not see a way forward, and so I did the only thing that I could think of. And that action, tying bows around trees on campus, became a re weekly ritual for me. Along with Morgan Lynn, Kristen Dyke, Nikhil Pasula, Sierra Milroy, Katie Palo, Sarah Savage and Mackenzie Mirla, I began tying the bows. All of those are students and were students at MSU. We began tying the bows, each one representing a known survivor at that point. And that process became for me an every Saturday and every Sunday morning meditation from February through early April. And after that, the Parents of Sister Survivors Engage was born. I don't usually use this this way. So you can see, oh, Sunny has taken away my entire slideshow here. <laughs> okay, we'll just do it this way. This is, these are some of the trees that we tied early on in the winter. It was about 17 degrees with a blowing wind. You can see how deep the snow is. Here's my powerful group of students and our sign that we hoped would give a message to the leadership at that time, particularly John Engler on his first day at work. Every line you speak, every time you write about that Nassar thing, as it was called then, put survivors first. More bows. Posse then came together in a group of parents who came to a board meeting that April, bringing pictures of our daughters. There was no room for us in the board meeting, we were told, and we were not allowed to bring signs, the first time that that rule had ever been put into place. Later that spring, we protested with 333 teal pinwheels outside of the administration building. We have what we call Atlanta's legacy tree outside of Will's house with ribbons for all of the sister survivors. This is what we were facing at the time. The headline here is Joel Ferguson, no apologies. That extended to much of the leadership at MSU. We protested with Reclaim MSU and rally on the anniversary. We started some workshops in collaboration with the museum. <laughs> we made teal sashes so that we can march in Washington <laughs> next year as sister survivors. We made 
the tiles, helped make the tiles along with many museum staff members that you see on the wall of 505 in the exhibit. We began then, because there was no teal on campus after the removal of the bows, to create Tibetan-style prayer flags, 505, one for each of the sisters. These are some of the signs, some of the flags, and some of the things that the student community has written on the flags. We estimate that there are over 4,000 signatures. This is what a typical prayer flag looks like on the back. The front has a survivor's name. The back has signatures from the MSU community that took us, I think, about seven months to gain. I'm showing you these that are single because they're easier to read, I think, from the back. Thank you for speaking up for all survivors. As a parents group, Posse began stringing the flags. We engaged with a student group of volunteers to do a last minute dash in getting them all strung. Then we were able to work with the city of East Lansing to hang them. They're in the square across from the Marriott Hotel. And there are four sections that extend down Grand River. When we were tabling for those flags, a strange healing occurred for us as parents who we were there working to gain those signatures. So many people, so many women, some young men came up and I could tell as they learned about the process and what we were doing, that they were survivors themselves. Some just from body language, and while we invited them to sign their own flag and self-disclose, some were too scared to do that. Some signed one in a little tiny corner, just her initials in one little section of the flag, and others were ready to step forward and write their name large. Those flags are hanging upstairs in the stairwell now, and I hope that you and see them and honor those survivors that these girls here have inspired to come forward. One woman who came up to the table and hugged me said, it never goes away. That's what people don't understand. It just never goes away. And she cried in my arm. She was not the only one. We did what we did for our girls, and in the process, we leaned on one another. In the process, it was not the projects that we created as a parent group, or any sort of experience that we tried to create, but it was the group itself that was the most meaningful. And what I found is that while rituals may offer comfort, it is community that helps us to heal. The message of this exhibit, one that was developed by the survivors themselves, is that you are not alone. That's the message that we need to give one another in every circumstance in a very disconnected world. That I see you, I hear you, and you are not alone in your pain. You're here tonight or listening because you have a greater understanding of the conversations that need to take place. Help us, please, to make a difference. Be an advocate with us. Listen, believe, act. In the second gallery of this exhibit, we're drawn to the butterfly dress, Alexandra Burke's beautiful butterfly dress, but we don't see just behind it the shadow on the wall. The girls, 
that helped to co-curate this exhibit insisted that it be there so that you see where they are. The butterflies ascend toward the ceiling, but even in the same day, a survivor can be the crouched figure on the floor. Don't turn away from that figure on the floor. Don't turn away from hard conversations about child sexual abuse. To paraphrase New York Times columnist David Brooks, we build community by making promises to each other, being accountable to one another, and working toward a common end. The common end that we want, and that we invite you to work toward with us, is the end of child sexual assault. commercial glass tile to uniform, 
hand cut colored glass, too dangerous, and ceramic tile, not as pretty. I remembered something from my childhood. I bought some supplies and tested the idea over the weekend. Pretty certain I had lost my mind. <laughs> At the next meeting, I pulled the prototypes out of my bag. Shrinky dinks, painted with alcohol-based ink. For those of you who aren't familiar with shrinky dinks, they're a kid's toy, clear plastic that you color on and bake in the oven. When they're heated, they shrink and harden. Often the process isn't perfect, so there's some curling and bending, which made them ideal. Each one would be as individual as the survivors themselves, but they'd be visually similar enough to hold together as a group. <coughs> we decided to do a hybrid. We'd include as many photos as were submitted. For each of the other survivors, we'd create a shrinky dink to hold place for them. Immediately, the advisory council offered to make the shrinky dinks themselves, which made the idea so much more meaningful. <coughs> Fast forward through, quote, possible mutagenic and endocrine disruptor effects, mixing the shrinky dinks, and you can see the end result. Over 550 acrylic tiles were hand painted by survivors, their families, and allies um, at two work sessions. The shrinky dink idea may have seemed silly on the surface, but it ultimately served as a pathway to more inclusion and meaning making than we would have accomplished without it. This is just one example of the sort of creative collaborative magic that occurred during the making of this exhibit because I only have five minutes. Um, I remember talking to Valerie Von Frank and expressing to her how fun it was to work with her in the advisory council. I hesitated because fun certainly wasn't the right word for the situation. Because she's a very kind and generous person, she said, I know what you mean, and I know that she did. What I meant was that even though the subject matter is so incredibly painful, I have absolutely enjoyed getting to know the amazing human beings on the council. The feeling of doing meaningful work with highly creative and passionate people is what has kept me going when I wanted to quit. Brene Brown wrote a book called Daring Greatly, in which she talks about the strength of vulnerability. She says, quote, vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, courage, empathy, and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. It was exactly this sort of vulnerability and strength that the members of the Advisory Council embodied every day which in turn inspired and compelled the museum exhibit team to rise to the challenge. We knew that what we were doing was important, that it was right, and that we didn't want to let the team down. I feel incredibly honored to have been part of creating this exhibit and to have served as a tool for the advisory council to use to tell their story. At the private opening, I overheard an attendee say that she could tell that the exhibit was a labor of love. I can vouch for the entire exhibit team that it is just that. Finally, I want to thank the survivor artists whose work is in this exhibit. You made my job a heck of a lot easier. It's hard to make something look bad when you're given such beautiful art to work with. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you uh, who spoke tonight, and I'd like to thank Mark for including me on this program. Um, I am a, a real departure from the other speakers. Uh, as somebody who spends her time commenting on art, 
Um, and, uh, and I really uh, am just blown away by the efforts um, that you all have talked about tonight. So thank you. One of the questions I often ask myself in my research on contemporary art, and I focus on India and Pakistan, is what can art and artists do that other ways of knowing, of understanding, and of making impact in the world cannot? What makes art do uh, very special and unique things? A set of answers to that question are put forth in Finding Our Voice. Others come in the other projects that I'm familiar with uh, that have been and put on serially by my own department, the Department of Art, Art, History, and Design at MSU across the year. These are projects that we put on um, on our own because we couldn't not. They include the Teal Quill Project, a partnership between, sorry, <clears throat> between issues. <laughs> yeah, no, Mark, Mark went and got them because he knows what he's doing. It's all right. Thanks. I'll be okay, I promise. Okay, they include the Teal uh, Quill Project, which was a partnership between our faculty member, Anna Buckner, and Small Talk, an art center in Lansing, in which volunteers so, sought to sew so, so quilt for each of um, the 500 plus survivors. And Babette Shaw's The Wash, as it seems, the exhibition she mounted in the MSU Union Gallery in January, during which she also worked with campus-based survivors of sexual assault uh, for her ongoing testimony-based social practice work that's called the Panty Project. While these three projects, meaning this one with the Army of Survivors at the Center and these other two, engage in different ways with the events that we're here to discuss, they share some common answers to the question of what is it that art can do. One, Art can materialize the immaterial. A quilt gives material forms to feelings of care by being a testament to the labor involved in caring. A painting, like the one upstairs, can represent the complexity of psychic trauma and through the work that is in that painting becomes itself a manifestation, a materialization of that process. Two. Art can bridge between the individual and the collective. One of the main challenges that Finding Our Voice takes on is how to demonstrate the scale of the violence we're dealing with, the sheer number of people affected, without losing sight of the individuals involved. And in fact, everyone who's spoken before me has made that clear. Much of the artists, many of the artistic gestures in the exhibition balance that collective impact with individual voice from the teal ribbons to the painted glass, to the dress constructed from butterflies. Three, art can also show the limits uh, to other, of other forms of knowing. It pushes at those limits and often explodes them. Like Babette Shaw's Panty Project, finding our voice rests in large part on the act of giving testimony, of speaking your story. But that act is bound by conventions, conventions of speech, conventions of what's allowed in a court of law, for instance. It elevates one form of, of speaking over other forms of expression. And so when I viewed the exhibition here and also the Beth's work, I thought about the ways that the act of giving testimony is, can be both empowering and also limiting. It made me think of how some of the contemporary art that I know about has found ways to explore the limitations that the legal system places on speech. And so now, because I can't resist, I want to talk about just one of those works. Indian artist Amar Kanwar's Lightning Testimonies from 2007 is a multi-channel video work. It may seem remote to our experience here, but I assure you it is not. It focuses on the history of sexual assault in India, particularly, sorry, on the ways, I'm, I still have one, actually. I just need to pull myself together. Particularly on the ways in which rape is used as a tool of civil conflict and of war. It includes found footage and video interviews collected over the course of four years of research. So this means he basically went to conflict areas all through South Asia. 
for four years and videotaped survivors. Uh, he worked in six areas of India that have insurgency movements. He combined those materials with materials from the 1971 war that, that uh, uh, split what had been Pakistan into Pakistan and Bangladesh, and then the moment of India's independence in 1946 and 47, in which women's bodies became a body battleground between two emergent nations. He videotaped these testimonies, and they all played simultaneously on eight screens. In a kind of, and of course, India is confusing. It has many, many languages. So each of the screens have different languages that are playing, all of which are subtitled in English. So if you could imagine yourself sitting where that person is, what you do as a viewer is you zero into one view, listen to one story, and then you turn, and you zero into another story, and then you turn, and you switch from one context to the next. <laughs> and you understand how individual each story is, and yet how many there are, and how, many, how long it's been. Kamar also gives you moments of quiet, because he knows what he's doing. He interrupts the polyphonic work to focus an image of a branch or of a window screen. About this gesture, he says, and I'll close with a quote from him, I think we are all in search of that tiny image moment that can contain the ocean with all its creatures and sounds. If you find that image moment, it can be experienced in many different ways. The objective is to be able to transcend through many levels of seeing, to free oneself of each successive construct so that each experience has its own unique value. Thank you very much. today. So I thank all of you, especially the sister survivors and families and the museum family for asking me to be part of this. So thank you so much. And I've been reflecting on a series of questions that I want to raise tonight um, that have to do with essentially the relationship between objects and persons. Um, how do we understand that very deep and complex relationship as we've been hearing throughout, throughout this evening? I also am uh, taking a page, as it were, from one of Valerie's comments about the need for ritual and thinking about, in an anthropological way, uh, what some anthropologists have termed the invention of ritual and the possibilities for that. Um, that in some sense, uh, one of the things we're thinking about tonight is the possibility of inventing not exactly new rituals, but setting a conversation for considering putting pieces of other ritual processes together in a novel and perhaps um, healing way. And finally, thinking about issues of art making itself as a transformative ritual, and I think we all feel this in walking through the exhibit and seeing some of the art on display, which I'll be talking about a bit. So I want to hone in on a couple of really key questions. How do physical material objects, why do they matter so much in our, 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 our efforts to heal ourselves and to seek recovery from trauma? What can be expressed, as some others have asked today, in a material medium that, that can't simply be contained in words? And how do we make sense of the embodied material, materiality of healing through art making, through the encounter with 
with an exhibition like this, and how might an aesthetic interaction with a manipulation of the material world offer us a transformative space in which the person can perhaps project aspects of the self onto the material world, to view those aspects of the self from afar, so to speak, in that material expression, then taking it back in again with renewed strength. So what I'd like to offer now for a few minutes is a set of possibilities as we think about ritual and our, our very human engagement with ritual and material objects and the experience of trauma from Japan, uh, where there's a really a widespread and deep understanding that once a material object comes into contact with human beings, it's not exactly like the human being and object merge, but the object is an made animate in its contact with the person. So what's really interesting is that there are a whole series of um, ritual processes that acknowledge that close relationship between the material world, the object world, and person. So for instance, this is an image of Hari Kuyo, which is Kuyo, Kuyo is a word meaning, meaning memorialization, uh, for needles. Needles which are bent or broken um, are acknowledged as having served human beings uh, in a very special way, and that their labor on behalf of human beings should be acknowledged. So the, this is a beautiful print in which a woman is threading a needle, but in front of her you can see in a dish is a big chunk of tofu, a bean curd, and the needles will be placed into bean curd in a ritual process, which you can see happening here. Um, not great images here, but you can see now a whole collection of needles, and the, uh, the explanation is the needles have worked so hard, and now, they're being acknowledged, their work is being acknowledged through this soft substance, which is tofu. So it's, it's like a gift that people are giving back to the needles which have labored, labored so assiduously on behalf of human beings. At the same time, there is another related um, form of memorialization for dolls, uh, literally for anything with a, with a face. It, it covers uh, stuffed animals as well as dolls. And there's a sense that dolls have um, come into such close contact, especially with children, over their lifetimes. They have, in some sense, sacrificed, the dolls have sacrificed part of their animate lives on behalf of the child with whom they're connected. When the child sort of outgrows the doll, families generally feel very strong. You can't just pitch them in the garbage. You have to take them to a temple um, so that they can be properly memorialized, and then the spirit of the doll is separated from the physical doll um, in an act of recognition and memorialization. And you see here the doll is lined up, preparing for this, this ritual process. There's, a, I think, also a related set of practices around kinzukuri, kinsudi, kin meaning metal or gold. It's basically an idea of patching, of mending, um, to patch, but also, I think interestingly, to inherit, succeed, continue, or graft, as in a tree graft, uh, which I think is a fascinating set of um, associations, but essentially the idea is the, um, the broken object, be it a, uh, a tea, perhaps a tea bowl or, or a, a piece of fabric, is mended with a precious metal. And I'm hoping I can. Um, Sunny? <laughs> Sorry, Sunny. Can I get. Uh, ooh, I, I want to get to that. Am I, <clears throat> am I not showing it? Oh, no, that's See if it works. Okay, yeah, that's where I want to get. Okay, and then I just scroll this way to get further down or use the arrows. Still it says it's not supported. No, it's not on that. Oh. <laughs> what I'm trying to show you <laughs> are, are some really beautiful images of uh, traditional tea bowls mended with gold. And the, the effect is um, really spectacular in the sense that you, he you see the history of the break. And you also see the history of the mend. And so both of those things are there simultaneously. The break, 
and the putting that together again. Um, and the mend is purposefully um, highlighted so that you know it's history, not an idea. Wait, so I can go like, yeah, 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 yeah. you're a bit of so, yeah, easier to say than done here. Okay, I'm not going to try to go further through this, but I'm happy to send you on to some of these uh, these links. You can see where the tea bowl has been broken, but mended with the gold. And I guess my point tonight here for our discussion is the simultaneity of the break and the mend, um, the breaking apart and the putting back together, but never obscuring the originary break. Um, which I think really gets back to issues of witnessing and memory that we talked about uh, throughout uh, this evening. Um, so let me see, I'm sorry, sorry. How do I get back to my, going back to the, yeah, thank you. Okay, stick around because I want to show the, the, the image <laughs> of the photo. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I want to get there. <laughs> if we can get to that first one, just the first one is fine. Okay, there, there's a related um, uh, set of practices in Japan of patchwork and mending, which also celebrate the rip, the tear, not with fabric that is supposed to really look like the original, but rather with something radically different. And yeah, so an old cotton kimono, um, aizome indigo dye, very traditional. And you can see that over the years, it's been patched with radically different uh, fabrics from very different sources. Um, in this case, all hand-woven um, uh, ikat kasuri dyed. But again, the emphasis I want to make is on the, um, the valorization of the mend, not trying to make it invisible, but rather putting it forth as something to really be valued. Yeah, now back to the slide. You don't have to go to the, to the other one. Just, no, yeah, we'll just go back to the part of things. So be honest, right? Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Great. Marvelous. Okay. So this brings me to Amanda Cormier's song, which was sung at, at the opening um, um, roughly a week ago which I think in musical form echoes with some of the issues I've been bringing up in terms of Japanese traditions of, of um, mending and heal, <laughs> healing and repair. And I'm quoting from her lyric, sometimes all I can hear is the screams, all part of some big bad dreams, sometimes. But now in this time I remember how it feels to sing, and with time this little girl will break free. I'm struck by, in the song, and when I heard it performed, the, um, the power of the phrase sometimes, that it, it had a, a multitude of meanings and shifted like a pivot in many, many parts of, of her song. And for some reason, this field evoked for me, at least, some of the issues I've been bringing up with um, uh, the issues from Japan. Another quick issue, uh, um, set of associations I just want to talk about quickly is from Okinawa, from the Ryukyu Islands, an idea of Mabui Gumi, or the loss of a soul, and also the ritual attempts to bring the soul back. So the idea that a living person can be separated from their soul as a result of a traumatic or sudden experience. And often ritual specialists, especially shamanists in the Ryukyu context, will be called by a family to help them retrieve the soul of a person who is particularly um, traumatized in one way or another. There's a sense also that um, this is linked to a very specific geographical location. The traumatic event had a spot where it happened. And this is from my field work in, uh, actually in Tinian, um, in Micronesia, following an Okinawan family who were going back to memorialize a deceased relative who um, died during World War II. And this uh, person was, uh, was killed in 1944. Um, 
And the family went back to essentially reunite the spirit of the deceased person with the family because the spirit had been trapped on the island of Tinian. And it's a complicated ritual. I'm happy to talk about it more later. But uh, suffice it to say, what happens in the course of the ritual is the spirit, the female shamaness who is holding the um, bundle of uh, incense there, is calling the spirit of the deceased into the bundle of incense. In that sense, I would argue, is materializing the otherwise immaterial spirit, giving it a physical form. This is then, was then carried back by the son, who is in the immediate foreground. He was instructed to keep it um, wrapped around his belly, liter literally as if he was pregnant, and take it directly back to the family mausoleum, where the shamanists joined him, and the spirit of the deceased was um, put into the mausoleum, rejoined with the family. And this was all to address problems that, that were occurring in the family. Um, so through the lens of Japanese and Okinawan ritual practices, um, I have kept thinking about this idea of soul return. And so across campus, clearly, where so much trust was so deeply betrayed, over 200 trees were wrapped in teal bows, as, as Valerie and others have described. In, a, in effect, binding up wounds to souls, psyches, and bodies, in the hope that someday those long shattered bonds of trust could be restored and repaired. And in turn, Jordan Fisherman's three part canvas takes us on, I think, an epic journey of bodily violation and reformation, reformation, culminating in a triumphant gymnast roaring her defiance as her sisters disassemble the very institution that had betrayed them. And in turn, um, Elena's tapestry, I think, beautifully illustrates a, a, a similar journey, in a sense, from um, one perhaps more contained state to something that opens up. And for me, the, and I would feel much more comfortable to, uh, for Elena to talk about this, but for me, the middle panel is the most evocative and, and fascinating because the technique she's used is very painterly. It's, it's painting uh, directly on the threads, both warp and weft, and so you're left with this very, I think, flowing sense of the progression of the textile. But in the middle panel, she's interspersed tapestry, and you can see these um, uh, darker red, sort of triangular shapes in, on the image to the right, which is a close-up of the middle panel. And for me, partly as a textile person, the um, technique of tapestry is quite, quite different than painting on a warp or weft. And it penetrates the textile in a structural way that I think is really important. So in conclusion, um, I, I want to bring up, again, a couple of, of um, thoughts, one from Japan and one not. Um, I've worked with and, and know this particular artist, um, Mario Yagi, who works on projects that involve what she calls nawa, taken from the uh, Japanese term shirinawa, which is the traditional rice straw rope that marks a sacred space. And she's translated nawa as the combined collective energy of a group that gets contained in this twisted rope. And here she did this um, piece uh, after the great 1995 earthquake in Kobe. And you can see the, uh, the participants gathering and beginning to twist the nawa rope, which was made of clothing from victims and from family members. And, whoops, there were more pictures, but I guess they're not here. Um, uh, eventually, the Nawa uh, was erected in a, in a vertical shape and was burned. And that's a very traditional way to um, essentially expiate uh, both pollution and um, uh, sadness and tragedy. And then everyone who participated took a piece of that, um, the ash, home with them. Finally, there's, uh, Alan, there's another couple of slides missing, I'm sorry. Um, Julian Bonder, for instance, I'll just quickly describe it, uh, did a, uh, a memorial in not France to memorialize the, the slave trade. And it, it's a very complex memorial, but it's set along the, the river, and the river routinely floods the memorial, on which are inscribed all of the names of the slave ships, 
and the dates that they arrived in the harbor. That means that the community has to gather routinely and frequently to clean up the memorial. And I think that um, complicates our, perhaps our ideas of memorials as being sort of passive places that you just go look at. So you could make something that involves um, a continual participation by the community in some way to, to trouble that usually much more passive um, uh, set of possibilities. So I think I'm going to end it there, so just with was, these words. So this was in reference to a potential memorial on campus? Yes, in reference to a potential memorial, just thinking about potential spaces on campus as we move forward, perhaps. Um, the, to, to memorialize, to, to honor all the sisters and others? Yes, yeah, I mean, to, or to begin the conversation of whatever shape that would take. Um, and I'll just conclude, because I know time is, is brief, that these wounds should never be denied or covered over, but through art and ceremony, the cracks may be visibly filled in and simultaneously always remembered and witnessed. Such a memorial just might, against all odds, return us to a sense of shared compassion and decency so long absent here and create for survivors and allies alike a truly healing landscape. Thank you.